everyone welcome thank you for tuning in to mirror now i'm samika kapoor and i'm in conversation with the former union minister and also a two time parliamentarian from the lok sabha mr manish tiwari here with me so thank you so much for talking to mirror now and taking out time for us my so pleasure because because you are a former inb minister information broadcast minister so my first question to you will be about the it surveys and not raids or searches that are being carried out at the offices of the bbc both in the national capital and in mumbai now at the very outset what has been your first reaction to it or do you think this is in a reaction to the controversial bbc documentary because they are definitely maintaining it's a case of a suspected tax evasion and maybe they're going to come up with a case uh, that they can make out of compliance a uh, non compliance on the bbc's part well uh, for the lack of a better word it is uh, downright silly uh, if not imbecile uh, to put it mildly and the reason i say that is because india is going to host the g20 later this year and as an emerging great power when you survey slash raid slash investigate a public broadcaster of another country ostensibly after a two part documentary that they ra ran it does not require much rocket science for anybody to put together that uh, obviously the two are connected and therefore it sends out a very very negative signal uh, and really portrays us as an insecure power rather than an emerging power uh, if we are not able to take criticism in our stride so therefore under those circumstances you can make out any case against anybody eventually that case has to stand in a court of law eventually those allegations that you make or whatever complaint that you file has to be evidenced uh, has to be proven substantiated in a court of law and so therefore uh, merely to say that uh, there are certain allegations with regard to transfer pricing which are also not there in the public domain as to what is the uh, what are the kind of allegations which are there uh, it does not really augur well for india's international image uh moreover it has a chilling effect on the freedom of speech and expression what is the message that you are giving to even indian media houses uh the message that you are giving is that uh, criticism uh will be met by coercive uh law enforcement action and is that the kind of democracy uh that we want to create in this country is that the kind of image of india which is uh, the world's largest democracy do we want to convey outside and that's why i had said that the bright spark who dreamed this up is actually uh, prime minister narendra modi's worst enemy so while you're talking about freedom of speech i will have to take you to the parliament session that has just broken for a recess budget 2023 What do you make of uh, the expungement of uh, speeches of Rahul Gandhi and the leader of the opposition Rajya Sabha, Mr. Malikarjun Khadgan? It's not just the Congress Party. The TMC MP Shogunta Roy and also Shantanu Sen, even their speeches were expunged. Of course, the chair maintains that they have discretionary powers, and if they deem fit, they are they are going to go ahead and uh, uh, going to go ahead and expunge these portions or excerpts from the speeches. Do you think there is a need for some sense of a check and balances to bring about some semblance as far as the opposition voices? Uh, in the parliament is concerned look there's been a tradition in parliament that uh, every party irrespective of whatever political shade it comes from has always been extremely respectful and ref respectful to the point of being deferential to the chair and this is primarily because the chair is perceptionally at least expected to behave in a completely impartial manner uh therefore this is a very strange kind of perspective in a day and age of uh, instant uh, dissemination of information through both broadcasting and social media that you are trying to bolt the uh, stable doors after the horse has uh, really run its course so therefore under those circumstances what is it that expunging those remarks is going to essentially uh, do uh, it again sort of uh, leads into a specter that are you insecure of history 
Are you insecure that uh, if those remarks are left on the record, which in the first case should not be expunged because Article 105.2 uh, gives members of parliament the privilege uh, to speak without fear or favor and uh, say what they feel like on the floor of the house. And that's why that privilege, which is uncodified, is a part of the constitution of India. And therefore, under those circumstances, you see, again, it sends out a message of uh, great insecurity that you are completely and absolutely intolerant to criticism, which I do not think, as I earlier said, whether in the case of the survey slash raid slash investigation into the British Broadcasting Corporation or for that matter what happened on the floor of the house, uh, it does not really forget the partisan politics part of it, does not really paint India in a very good light also. So, but even before the parliament session began, or even the first few days of it, uh, you had put out like series of tweets and you had even put across an adjournment motion notice when it comes to the executive versus the judiciary. You had said that it appears that the executive is trying to orchestrate a sense of a confrontation with the judiciary. Uh, were you upset with the statements that were made by the law minister and also uh, the vice president? Well, in the completely country? unnecessary, you know, for the simple reason that uh, you may not like the collegium, but the collegium is the law of the land. The collegium was uh, incubated by the 1993 mm -hmm. Advocates on Record uh, matter. And it was sanctified further by the presidential review in uh, 1998, when the Supreme Court, again nine judges of the Supreme Court, answered that uh, reference and fleshed out the collegium further. The government tried to then, uh, uh, well, uh, restore in their words constitutional balance by bringing in the National Judicial Appointments Commission Act by amending the constitution. It unanimously or near unanimously passed muster in parliament, was ratified by 15 state legislatures. But ultimately, the Supreme Court, which is the final arbiter of constitutionality of a statute, struck it down four is to one. And the government did not push back after that. It took them 470 days to file a review petition, which was then dismissed both on the grounds of a limitation, that is, it was inordinately delayed, as well as on uh, merits. The government chose not to file a curative review. If the government is unhappy with the NJAC judgment or it feels that there is something which needs to be done to the memorandum of procedure, what stops the government from bringing another legislation before parliament? But these uh, statements from the hip on a daily basis uh, do create a sense that uh, the government or at least some sections of the government are trying to orchestrate an unnecessary a confrontation with the judiciary which is completely and totally uncalled for and uh, the report which appeared in one of the papers uh, today uh, which seemed to suggest uh, that a particular right-wing publication has gone to the extent of saying that the Supreme Court is a tool for anti-India forces where where are we heading if we are going to delegitimize the apex judiciary, the highest court in the land, uh, what, the, what confidence will people have, both in India and abroad, on your judicial institutions, especially when you have such a huge backlog of over two and a half or three crore cases which are pending in different courts at different levels. So it's not just the judiciary over which you gave adjournment motion notices in the Lok Sabha, but your pet project of sorts for which you've been putting across adjournment motion notices for eight consecutive sessions in the parliament starting in September 2020 is essentially about the status at the line of actual control with the LSE with the China, where you have categorically mentioned that it appears that there is an attempt by China to change the status quo at the LAC. Why do you think the government doesn't want to come on the talking table or provide a picture that is going to be clear for the entire opposition to understand as well? Because the government, when they made a statement on it, they maintain that the opposition is trying to mislead by painting a picture that is far from reality. Well, uh, the only thing far from reality 
uh, is the government's obvious uh, attempt not to acknowledge that there has been a transgression uh, across the line of actual control. You see, nobody says that it is an easy situation to deal with. And it is not uh, at least my endeavor to embarrass uh, the government. What we are essentially trying to understand is that if you go back in time, uh, Brit the, 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 the Imperial British actually made a first attempt, or rather the last attempt, to delineate the boundary in the western sector, which is China's western sector, India's northern sector, way back in 1899 when they proposed uh, the mcdonald mccartney line, which was not accepted by China. Then in 1913, they attempted to delineate it in the eastern sector uh, when they proposed the McMahon line, which uh, uh, the Chinese representative initialed, but then subsequently refused to ratify. But ispo facto, the mcdonald mccartney line and the uh, McDonald line were representative of uh, what India's perception of its borders wa uh, was. Then you had this protracted negotiation in the late 50s and the early 60s, which led to the 1962 war. And after that, there was a standoff. And then in 1993, you negotiated an agreement with China, which was later on fleshed out in 1996 and uh, 2012. And obviously, post-2012, which is when President Xi Jinping assumes office in China, there has been an attempt to repudiate uh, those agreements which have been arrived at. So, you are now dealing with a new China and it is not only India. Whether uh, it's the Doklam or the Pangong or the recent Tawang clashes. That and not only that, it is whether it is uh, constructing artificial islands in the South China Sea, it is moving on the sovereignty of Hong Kong, it's the attempt to be less than truthful about the COVID-19 situation in the early days of the outbreak. So you have a strange paradox out here, while you have almost 50 to 60,000 troops uh, since the April of 2020, and then of course you had the Galvan, uh, yes. uh, you know, uh, the, the Galvan clashes in the June of uh, 2020, eyeball to eyeball, and then on the other hand, you have trade with China, uh, which has been increasing in these two years to the detriment of India. The balance of trade has always been adverse against India, but the fact is that even when you have the standoff on the border, uh, you have trade actually going up. Now, is it a case that you have been able to dehyphenate commerce and conflict, or is it a case that you are actually subsidizing China's transgressions into Indian territory. Now, these are all very serious issues which require a dispassionate and a calm discussion on the floor of the House. Now, obviously, government is concerned because discussions in Parliament can be aggressive. But then, uh, whenever there has been a discussion on a sensitive subject in Parliament, Parliament and parliamentarians have risen to the occasion. They have been sober. On they national been, security And issues. they have been circumspect. And they have been extremely responsible. Let's not forget that in uh, the November of 1962, when the Chinese aggression was playing out on our northern borders, Parliament between the 7th to the 15th of November, both in the Lok Sabha and the Rat Sabha, at the initiative of late Prime Minister Mr. Atul Bihari Vajpayee, who was a part of a four-member Jansang group in the Raj Sabha, uh, Parliament discussed yes. the uh, border situation ad nauseum. Is there a modus vivendi possible uh, whereby both uh, China, India and Asia at large can really achieve their true potential? See, those are the contours of the debate that uh, Parliament needs to really apply itself to. But why and do you think the government is shying away from a discussion on it? Well, uh, frankly, I don't have an answer to that. For that, you'll have to ask people in government as to why they are not willing to uh, discuss it and debate it. In fact, I even suggested that uh, uh, if, let's suppose, a larger discussion in parliament is not uh, feasible for whatever reason, otherwise it shouldn't be a problem, 
at least in the Standing Committee of Defence or the Consultative Committee of Defence. And in the Consultative Committee of Defence on which I serve, many senior people are members who have been ministers in the Government of India. You can actually have a very, very responsible, candid, threadbare, uh, extremely Chath Chatham House rules discussion on it. So talking about the recently concluding um, budget session that had just broken for a recess, the Prime Minister made a speech. But of course the opposition's demand was uh, a joint parliamentary committee that should be ordered as far as the Adani Enterprises financial irregularities are concerned or the fate of the LIC and the SBI is concerned. Sir. The government never really addressed these issues particularly. Are you hopeful that they are going to do it in the near future when the parliament reconvenes? And will your demand stand for a JPC still? So the question is why a joint parliamentary committee? Because they, they feel that they are not opposed to the committee or a constant uh, investigation, but the remit of the committee is going to be with the government then. See, why a joint parliamentary committee? The joint parliamentary committee is supposed to actually address the same issues which the Supreme Court is now addressing currently. And the government has readily agreed uh, to the Supreme Court's uh, superintendence or oversight over precisely the issues which the opposition flagged and asked for a joint parliamentary committee. You see this very strange paradox whereby you have a conglomerate, an Indian conglomerate, which has a presence uh, across the world, uh, which, which uh, announces a follow-on offer of its stock. And then you have a little-known entity, at least, or rather an unknown entity in India, um, Hindenburg Research, which I frankly I had never heard of before this, come out with a report, right? And that report makes uh, very, very grave allegations. The Adani group comes out with a very detailed rebuttal, but the market uh, chooses to believe the allegations as opposed to the rebuttal and react in a particular manner. And it uh, it unravels to an extent where the follow-on offer has to be called off. So obviously it raises questions about the oversight and superintendence of India's capital markets. Whether our uh, market uh, oversight mechanisms are robust enough. And if you recall, uh, SEBI actually got its statutory status, it got its teeth after the Harshad Mehta JPC of 1992. The whole process was further strengthened after the Ketan Parikh JPC in 2001. So, therefore, a joint parliamentary committee on which the government in any case would have a majority would actually be a constructive platform to very objectively look at uh, both our capital market oversight mechanisms as also the superintendence which the Reserve Bank of India exercises over the other lending institutions and really discern as to whether this entire architecture uh, is strong, resilient, sustainable, robust enough uh, to ensure that the wealth of small investors is not wiped out. You see, today it is Adani. Tomorrow it could be anybody else. Any other short seller you know, can come out with a report and the Adani stock, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is not very widely held or was not very widely held. But imagine a stock which is far, far more widely held and then you have a bloodbath of this sort. You are talking about uh, wiping out the life savings of millions and millions of people. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is that Life Insurance Corporation and the other um, uh, insurance companies, they actually hold people's money in fiduciary trust. And therefore, for them to be taking a position uh, north when the market is moving south uh, also kind of uh, lends itself uh, to a conclusion that uh, was there some kind of an invisible hand which was guiding those decisions. Yeah, what were the compulsions? Because of That's right and the, why were they taking those positions when obviously the market was moving in a completely different manner. So there, these are the reasons why uh, a joint parliamentary committee is essential and we uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, would continue uh, persevering with the demand for a JPC. So, talking about the markets, your recent tweet about uh, the Air India buying 470 aircrafts 
has created a furor. They feel that why is Mr. Manish Tiwari upset about it? It's going to create jobs in India as well. They are buying out 470 aircraft. You have the top global leaders lauding this historic deal. Why is Mr. Manish Tiwari upset about it? Well, uh, obviously, Ms. Uh, President Joe Biden is going to laud it because if... Uh, uh, a million jobs is, are going to be created in, a, in the United States of America or if the economy of the United Kingdom is going to benefit from it, uh, Rishi Sunak or President uh, Joe Biden are obviously going to extol the virtues of this, uh, this, this, this transaction. But the moot question remains that India needs to become a manufacturing hub. And so therefore when you sign a deal ostensibly of 85 billion US dollars, which at a back of the envelope calculation is 6,80,000 crores. The question is how much of this uh, is or should have flown back to India in terms of augmenting our manufacturing capacity. Uh, were or were they were Boeing and Airbus willing to give certain commitments that a part of the manufacture would take place in India. So you have a strange situation whereby, uh, whereby the US economy, the economy of the United Kingdom and possibly even the economy of China because to the best of my knowledge, both uh, Boeing and Airbus you know, do have some uh, manufacturing facilities in China also. All these economies are going to benefit. While of course uh, the Tata Enterprises is a private uh, company you know, which uh, has taken over Air India. But ultimately it is Indian money which is going out. And so therefore my limited concern was that this particular transaction should have been structured in a manner whereby it would have augmented manufacturing capacities in India. Of course, you have a lot of people trolling and telling me as to how many pilots uh, how will, will, be be, hired? will be hired, how many air hostesses will be hired, how many ground staff will be hired, how many MROs would happen. But very respectfully, I would like to tell them that uh, A, uh, a large or a substantive part of it is the replacement of the old fleet. And number two, uh, Air India already has a very high uh, employee to aircraft ratio and they have been downsizing very aggressively. Uh, a large part of their workforce uh, is either opting for voluntary retirement or it is being suggested to them that it would be better if they opt, uh, you know, opt out of the company. So therefore under those circumstances, if on one side Air India is downsizing so aggressively, then how do you really extrapolate to say that this, in this, huge, uh, uh, this huge transaction is going to have an employment multiplier? Just before I let go of you, I have to ask you the question about when you have issues pertaining to the Adani enterprise, when you have issues pertaining to the Prime Minister's speech or the fact the manner in which the opposition is not being given a free hand to express themselves, why don't we see the opposition unity in the parliament? We did see a stance that was taken by the BRS and the Ahmadi Party and the TMC which wasn't really in line with what the Congress wanted to do. Uh, do you think there is a need for the opposition to recalibrate and perhaps uh, come up with a fresh strategy to corner the government? There is something that is missing when it comes to the opposition strategy. Right. The fact is that you have plurality of political views in this country. And many who are in the opposition actually compete for the same space in different states. And that is the political reality. So to the extent possible that you can have a convergence in issues on issues, it takes place. But beyond that, to expect a chimera and say that uh, the entire opposition will be on the same page on each and every issue, uh, I think uh, is more of, uh, more of kite flying or more of wishful thinking uh, rather than really the bread and butter or the, the brass tacks of politics. And the, the other thing is that opposition unity in today's uh, day and age uh, if it is seen in the context of an attempt to replace the uh, incumbent government. You see the model which was perhaps uh, applicable in 1977 or in 1989, uh, we've kind of moved on and therefore... It has become personality clash. No, th so therefore, you see, if you have a person or uh, an individual uh, who can 
articulate an alternative vision uh, that look this country has been run in a particular manner for nine years and I uh, do feel that this is the manner in which this country should be run. I, given the instruments of information dissemination, uh, today narratives have become extremely scalable. So you do not really actually require that ground presence which you required two or three decades ago. Uh, in the absence of a ground presence with uh, a proper narrative and a properly articulated vision, I think you will be able to reach across to millions and millions of uh, people. Well, I appreciate you joining us here and giving uh, your valuable time. Uh, we shall come back to you and trouble you again once the budget session begins. Thank you very much. That Thank is, you very uh, much. Mr. Manish Tiwari in conversation with me here at Mirarna for an exclusive interaction.